kind and most merciful Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. For all the blessings you, give, you have given us during the week and for bringing us here on this Sabbath day to worship you in spirit and in truth. Beat back the powers of darkness, Father, as we work to praise your name and hasten your coming is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we continue to worship by singing Smile a While and Give Your Face a Rest. And we are going to read the person that is close to us with a beautiful smile. Smile a while and give your face a rest.
son for opening him, Love at Home, 652. was far, far over. I bared in sin. I failed and couldn't win. I was deceived. The pleasures of this world couldn't fill the void within. Battered and bruised, Rejected and refused by the same world whose pleasures I enjoyed. Unrecognizable, deniable, 
I was sailing like a ship without a sail. Empty and broken, I needed a potter to mend my broken pieces, to put me back together, to give me a new slate. God looked down from heaven, hugged me as a friend, took me in his hands, and as a potter to the clay, he mended me, he cleaned me, he polished me, forgiven me, accepted me back, and gave me a new slate. You forgiven. A new slate has been given. Abide in me and I in you. I'll give you the power to stay faithful to the end. Forgiven. I am forgiven. So forgiven. Eternally forgiven. God redeemed me unrecognizable unshaken i am forgiven i have a new slate i am his royal priesthood i am a new creature all things have passed away and now i am brand new i am forgiven so forgiven eternally forgiven and now i am and now i am and now i am now i am yes now i am and now i am and now i am brand new
Before I speak to you, I see that the time is going, and I'm not going to labor the saints as it were, but I'm just, I just want to say a quick word on the school. Let us remember again, as we, I think it was said about two weeks ago, that the school is ours. It is not Greaves and Westmount and any of the other churches. So let us every day if we do nothing else remember the school in our prayers because we can never get worse we can only get better by God's grace you may be wondering why I'm standing here before you in this capacity it's family life day and it's so good to see all of the families and potential families standing before me today. You are already welcome, so I wouldn't belabor a point, but just to say it is good to see you as I gaze down upon your splendor and resplendency from this vantage point. Today I'm going to speak about raising children with God's help. And I pray that as I do my best to impart this message that God may indeed be with me as I do so. Raising children with God's help. As we all know, raising children in today's world is not an easy task. That is, raising children that will manifest the image of Christ in this time we're living in, the intensity of the diversionary tactics of the evil one has been exponentially magnified. Reason being, the devil knows his time is short and wants to ensure the roaring lion that he is, that very few of us as possible Make it to the kingdom of Christ, which is our ultimate goal with God's help. Fortunately for us, the Bible, the living word of God, gives us some guidelines on how to accomplish this monumental task. They can be found throughout the Bible. Some of the following texts illustrate this point. Let's read together, or as I read together in your hearing, what the Bible has to say. Proverbs 23, 24 to 25, KJV. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee, or him, or her, shall have shall rejoice. There's a second one, Malachi 2.15, as I read. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Put these two passages together and you have parents rejoicing and God rejoicing when the Christian home produces good and godly sons and daughters. The story is told of a young boy who was leaving for Iraq and on his last night at home, he went out with his friends, arriving home about 11.30. He made his regular stop at the refrigerator. His mother and father were in bed upstairs and as always did not feel right until they heard him come in. Typical parents. Our kids are always our kids even when they're big. 
The mother said to the father, Why don't you go down and talk to him about spiritual matters? We have always had him in church, and he's always been a good boy. But I want to be sure that he is right with the Lord before he goes off to war. The father went down, and in only a few minutes, came back to bed. When I got to the foot of the stairs, the mother asked, Did you speak to him? That is the mother asking the father. The father said, I didn't have to. When I got to the foot of the stairs, I heard him praying at the kitchen table. Dear God, thank you for my wonderful parents who taught me right from wrong, who taught me to live for you and trust you. I pray, Lord, that if I do not come back from this war, that you will give them the peace of knowing that I have studied with you, I have walked with you, I have talked with you, and if I don't back, and if I don't come back, to let them know that I have died in you and die with the assurance that I will see you when you come. The father said, I didn't need to ask him a thing. He's everything that we want him to be. We ask the question, where do good human beings come from? Where are character, compassion, and courage built? When God was speaking through Malachi about the damage of divorce in Judah, God said one reason he gave us marriage is that husband, wife, mother, father, parents could work together. The operative word here being together with him creating good human beings. He's still doing that today, or he still asks that of us today. Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. I mean, if you look at it, the only ones that will carry on the legacy of the Christianity that we know is our children. And if we don't take the time and teach them, where would our religion our understanding, our sense of direction as far as Christ and his church go, be. We, where, do the Christians come, where do the Christians of the future come from? They come primarily from Christian homes. They come primarily from Christian fathers and mothers, again, parents, working together. Speaking to fathers today, I include the mothers. And the first word I want to use is perfection. Arguably, the greatest Christian in the history of the church, the Apostle Paul said, I do not claim to have already become perfect. I keep striving. Philippians 3.12 There never has been and never will be a parent who can truthfully say, I did the best I could. It would be nice if kids came with instructions like the barbecue grill or the television or the fridge or some of these lovely gadgets that we like to possess today. But unfortunately, they don't. We all make many parenting mistakes. I'm going to refer to somebody who's now become infamous, but do forgive me, since his words are germane to this topic. His name is Bill Cosby. Let me whisper it. Bill Cosby said, after his wife, uh, wait a second. Yes, the reason why we are good to our children and grandchildren today is because we are trying to get into heaven now. For all of the mistakes that we made with our kids, a sociology professor wrote a book, 10 Ironclad Rules for Raising Children. Ironclad. After he and his wife had twins, he revised the book. 10 Principles in Raising Children. After one of the child, he revised it again. 10 
suggestions for parents. Here we see parenting is not perfect and it is dynamic, which is why we need the, 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 the inflow of the Holy Spirit and God blessing us and imbuing us daily on how to manage our children. Failure is very, look, very often looked upon as negative, but it's not terrible. It reveals our humanity. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as the Bible says. There is none perfect. No, not one. Thy righteousness is as filthy rags in my sight. The way we deal with our mistakes and sins helps our children deal with theirs. When we honestly apologize to a child and ask for his forgiveness... We might, it might, that might be the best lesson we have taught them in a while. As parents, we are partners. When Paul teaches about the Christian home in Ephesians 6, the first term he uses is, again, parents, mothers, and fathers. When he mentions fathers, it is a warning a correction, a red flag. He says, fathers, do not exasperate. Do not provoke. Do not cause or elicit negative behavior in your children or even aggravate them. Yet, bring them up in the discipline Nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Old Testament was written in a male-oriented society and in almost all instructions about parenting are directed toward the husband and father. In a Christian society like ours, where men and women are equal, I believe God would use the word parent or mom and dad where he uses father. They are synonymous. Mother and father, again, are co-workers with God in the production of good human beings. The truth is, every Bible principle to get given to fathers is also given to mothers. As parents, we are our children's primary character builders. No people... None whatsoever that we know of. Actually, no. None at all. Not even that we know of. Influence our children more than we do as parents. No institution comes close to having the impact on character than the home. This is why it is under attack thus by the devil. He figures, destroy the family, destroy the world. So we need to be careful. It is not school, even if it's an Adventist school. It is not peers, even if they're the loveliest and greatest. It is not even, believe it or not, the church. Not even the church. Let me say that really quiet so nobody can hear me. It is the home. This is true because of the power of the early years. Roman Catholics have always said, give me a child or give us a child for the first five years of his life and he or she will be Catholic for the rest of his life. Modern psychology has reduced this to three years. Now think about that for a second. We are mother and father and the village, the general village. We have to force all of the positive information, all of the necessary, the necessary rubric that, that's needed to raise a child in three years. Ladies and gentlemen, as parents and guardians and a general village, we need Christ. The book, How the Twig is Bent, says, the central framework of character and attitudes toward life are there by the age 
of three. Let me say that again. All of, the, all of these things are required or placed, put in place by the age of three. The rest of life is formation within or formed or formulated between those boundaries. One to three. I love the book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten by Robert, by a certain author, Mr. Fulgham. In it, he gives a certain list. He says, share everything. Play fair. Don't hit. Put things where you found them. Clean up what you mess up. Don't take what isn't yours. Say you're sorry when, so when someone hurts you. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Milk is good for you. Do a lot of things like, or fill your days with activities like drawing, painting, playing, working, take a nap every day, look out for the traffic. You need to do that, kids. Look for the wonders of nature. Teach them about death. It happens. Pets die, and so do we. Then he says, everything you need to know about life is in one or all of these previous tasks that I just mentioned. We are primary. We are first in the building of character because of the time we have. Between infancy and maturity, a child has one, it is estimated, 108,000 waking hours. He will spend 1,000 of them in church, about 7,000 in public school or grieves, about 100,000 and about 100,000, the lion's share of this time, under the supervision of his parents. You cannot carve rotten wood. And every school teacher and Sabbath school teacher will tell you that a spoiled or selfish or mean or lazy child at home will be the same in school, in church, and in life, unless Jesus Christ comes in and makes a change of heart. And even then, they will have a long uphill battle in their Christian lives. It is hard, even for a newborn child of God, to shake off the effects of bad parenting. As parents, we are pals to our children. There is a four-point cross that is in every balanced life. Worship, paramount. Work, somebody has to make the money. Rest, we don't get enough. And play. The Bible says, a merry heart does well like a medicine. We need to play and have fun as a family. The story is told of a certain professor who asked the children of his church to give a list of things that make a good daddy, a good father. The first, first four were, can pump up a bike tire, can fish, can get a cat out of a tree, can fly a kite. This may sound like an oversimplification, but the family that isn't working is the family that, that isn't playing together. Playing together is an, is an essential trait of, a, of happy, healthy families. Certainly your children need to do their chores. And of course they need discipline with consistency. But what they also need desperately is f from their parents is a rousing game of hide and seek or monthly ping pong tournament or biking outside in nature, going for a nature walk or something wholesome with the family. A great thing happens when families to families when they play together. They begin to talk and laugh and lighten up. Family memories are built, inside jokes are shared, and serious moments of intimacy are communicated. Families need 
special times together to build lifelong memories to play together. As most experts will tell you, a family that plays and prays together stays together. But I would add that a family that plays together will be much more happy and healthy. For many families, play is the missing ingredient that glues the family together. Play can even open up closed spirits and heal broken marriages. We know instinctively that play produces family togetherness and support. We know that when we play together, we have a deeper sense of belonging and community in the family. Parents must proactively work at making a sense of belonging and community one of their key goals for family togetherness. Playing together as a family may open up the communication lines better than anything else you try. So now is the time to be proactive and create those family fun days and events that provide the catalyst for more effective communication. Do whatever it takes to keep the lines open. Even if it means picking up a basketball or going to the park on a regular basis, playing together and having a good time just may be that safety net you need to make a difference within your child's life. The story, of, the story is told of Todd and Charlotte. They had two beautiful children they had a, and had a very high-paying job. Todd's career was going through the roof. He was doing well. Then, tragedy struck. Charlotte, his wife, unfortunately died of a brain tumor. Before Charlotte died, Todd said he wanted to coach his children's little league and soccer teams. Because Todd's career would soon include travel, he had to make some difficult decisions about his career. Todd was making good money, but it wasn't as important as playing catch with his son or rollerblading with his daughter. Todd made the decision to quit his high paying job and to become a professor so he could play more with his kids and coach their teams. His annual salary was cut to what was once his expense account. His lifestyle had to change. He doesn't live in as large a house as he once did. Coaching his children's teams, coaching his children's, uh, let me read that again. He doesn't live in as large a house as he once did. His car isn't the same model as some of his Stanford MBA friends. But he is happily coaching his children's teams. He's now married to a lovely woman named Becky who suffered a similar loss. Her husband also died, maybe not of a brain tumor, but some other disease. And they now have four happy, content, and well-adjusted children who play and interact daily with their dad and mom and stepmom who have sacrificed financially to help their family thrive. The benefits of playing together are far more valuable than a big paycheck. The benefits, you didn't hear me, the benefits of playing together Spending time with your family is more important than a big paycheck. This is important. These days, we all live with stresses of a fast-paced life. Playing together is one area of our busy lives that we can pretty easily choose to cut out because it's play. Everything is usually all about work in order to make the other areas of our lives easier to manage. Yet, I challenge you, don't cut back on playing together. This is one simple area of life that can yield incredible benefits to you and your family. As parents, we are policemen. Do 
Do not, the Bible says. In Proverbs 23, verse 13, first part, do not withhold discipline from a child. <laughs> That's right, Sister Snape. Proverbs 29, 15 to 17, KJV says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. A child left to himself bringeth his mother and father, I hear it finishing, to shame. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Now, let me pause here and say that when we talk about rods and we talk about correction and we talk about spanking and we talk about corporal punishment, don't, let me be clear, picking up a piece of electric wire or throwing a stone or reckoning with a child when you're angry or beating the child mercilessly is not discipline. All this serves to do is cause the child to fear, resent you, and plot, depending on the child, your demise. That child also can think. That child was also born with the survival instinct. And if you strike a child in anything less than love, that child, depending on who or she, he or she is, will react, and it's usually negative. Fathers and mothers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of God. Somebody has to be in charge, and in the Christian home, that somebody is the team of mother, and father. The great Bible word used by Paul for Christian parenting in Ephesians 6 and by God for his parenting of us in Hebrews 12 is discipline. Christians argue over spanking and kids hope the Old Testament of use, Old Testament use of it is symbolical and not literal. I do understand this. The fact that there may well be a place for spanking, it is not the highest and best form of discipline. It should be used as a last resort. A few points about discipline are, be the boss. Children should not rule the roost. To refuse to discipline is to disobey God and damage your children. Assume responsibility in leadership in the home. You are not to be a tyrant. You are the leader. One distraught father said, when I was a kid, my father ruled. Now that I'm a father, my kids rule. I never got to rule anybody. Amen. <laughs> that is the tragedy, tragedy of the modern home. Children and youth are calling the shots. Children in charge, in quotes, is the source of much misery and conflict in the home. It is amazing how many two and three year olds there are who are in control of their homes. They rule with an iron fist they are ruthless in their demands. They set the temperature in the home. They're on center stage. They control the conversation. 
Their mothers are their slaves running behind them, picking up after them, trying to keep them happy. Fathers would rather work overtime than come home and put up with them. And this challenge of authority begins early. The little baby who screams and holds his breath is already trying to take over. By the time he approaches two, he's a wily veteran and, the campaign against, and, 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 and is on the campaign against authority. Again, Mr. Bill Cosby says, give me 200 active two-year-olds and I can conquer the world. A mother and her daughter, the story is told, were shopping for Father's Day. And a little boy pitched a fit in the store. We all have seen this. He fell on the floor and kicked his mother and begged. His mother begged him to get up. Seeing that as a teachable moment, the mother said to her daughter, Do you know what that boy needs? I guess the daughter, the mother expected the young daughter to say, A good spanking. But what the child said in her innocence really got me. She said, all that child needs is a good mommy and daddy. A little child shall lead them. Set limits and guidelines. Some things will not be tolerated. Many children get sick and tired of the four Ds that would get them in trouble. Actions that were disrespectful disobedient, dirty or nasty, and especially dangerous. I was told by one of my friends, his mother never allowed him to participate in any activity, even if it was cool, because everyone else was doing it, like going to dances and staying out late with friends and playing cards and doing all this other stuff. Because his mother saw them as questionable activities. He told me he thought his mother was a stick in the mud. Oh, I don't get to have any fun. My mom doesn't let me do anything. I'm always at home. All I do is go to church. And blah, blah, blah. So, I, he told me also that he now understands what she was trying to do. He's seen his friends. He intimated. I've seen them become addicted to drugs, incarcerated for various offenses, including murder. And those who are trying to put their lives back together after repenting from a recalcitrant and rebellious, tick brock in your ears existence. I try to tell the young people here all the time. Do not wait until you've finished school to realize I have made a mistake. You have a village of people around you. A lot of them may not make any sense now when they talk because you're old and you're passe. But those passe things never change. Those passe things get redressed in a modern age but they remain the same. So it's in your own best interest to listen because Pickney will not listen to their parents. Drink pepper water, lime, and sal. Has anybody ever heard that one? Okay. Take heed. I know we may sound old fashioned. I know that church may seem like passe. All we do is pray and sing. But believe me, there's a God up there who says, he needs you. See thou an army of youth rightly trained, I believe Ellen White says. Take heed. In the home, there are ironclad rules, such as no violence. Don't hit your sister. Don't call your mommy or daddy names. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't curse, etc. But we parents can be too strict sometimes. Remember the provocation? One comedian said that until he was five years old, he thought his name was shut up. Because every time he tried to say something to his parents, kids are people too. 
they have an opinion when they're not rude. When it's said right and correctly, they also have their say. They come from him, or children, and return to him. We house them, but we do not own them. And part of our teaching must be about their accountability and responsibility. When Cain killed Abel, God didn't go to Adam and say, what has Cain done? He went to Cain and said, what have you, Cain, done? Genesis 4.10 The home, like the church, must see every child headed toward an age of accountability and responsibility when children become adults in the sight of God. We are patterns also as parents. When it comes to Christian character, it is more caught than taught. It is our lives that teach true Christianity. If we are nominated for deacons at church and use profanity at home, is it any wonder that our children grow up and reject our faith? If we pray in church and pad our expense account, steal from our employer and other nefarious acts, is it any wonder that our children grow up and discard church as a vital part of their lives? When two demonic boys went on a killing spree in Columbine High School, remember this Columbine High School incident, they targeted Christians when one, of them, uh, when one of them asked Cassie Bernal, who was a student at the school at the time, if she was a Christian. She stood up and said yes. And she was promptly, unceremoniously gunned down. But there's a story behind that story. Cassie was at one time quite rebellious. Quite a rebellious teen. Tough love was badly needed. Her parents explained that they felt the need to take drastic action. Cassie's mother said, I couldn't pinpoint it. I just knew something was wrong. The Bernals learned that Cassie was interested in witchcraft and was involved with drugs and alcohol. They searched her room. You know, again, let me pause here. A lot of parents are of, I believe, the false impression that children under your roof have privacy. No such thing. If I ask you to open it, you open it and you show me. If I want to enter it, you open that door and let me in because I need to see. Nobody's going to come to me and find the stolen cocaine under your bed that I didn't know about. There is no privacy with a minor. They searched her room and found letters that talked about harming parents and others. Stunned, they responded firmly, courageously and lovingly. We knew she could not make wise decisions for herself, is her parents speaking. So we had to make them for her. They changed her school and cut off contact with friends who had exerted the wicked influences on her. They searched her room and backpack. They monitored her actions. Besides school, school was the only place she was allowed to go. Besides school, the only place she was allowed to go was to church. And that made most, if not all, of the difference. It was as though she, were in, she was in a dark room and somebody turned the light on. She saw the beauty that was surrounding her. She met Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Christian discipline. It was two parents brave enough to take the controls and call the shots in their home. 
In closing, I give you a, a simpler yet profound story. And now I give you, again, a different type of a success story. Every Sabbath, Frank and Lisa brought their daughter to church and, and Sabbath school and then went home and got on with their mundane activities, having parties, secular parties, or not wild, but not religious either. So they got done with their regular activities and their Saturday nights on the town. The little girl, a radiant Christian, loved church. That Saturday night, there was a party, like usual, in her home. She got out of bed and looked over this, the second floor rail. Now, I don't know how she could sleep in all that noise, but anyway. Her dad scolded her and asked her why she was awake. She wanted to know if she could come to the party. They promptly said no. It was a mommy and daddy kind of party. She saw the plates of food in the people's hands and asked if she could have some cake. When her dad said yes, she said, has anybody said the blessing? Now this is a little girl in the middle of a party coming out of a room and saying this in everybody's hearing. Well, that's what it took to kill the party. Shortly after that, like I said before, the party broke up. As that mom and dad cleaned up the mess that the party created, it pointed both of them to the mess in their lives. They asked, where are we headed as a family? That next Sabbath morning, they were in church with their little girl and are better, have been better Christians ever since. It is often said, like I alluded to previously, a little child shall lead them. This child, their daughter, was a beacon of light in their home and led her parents to a better understanding of their error and a, and a reordering of their relationship with God. Before I sit down, I'd like to admonish parents today that our children are not there to be feared. Our children are there to be worked with. Our children are there to be understood. There should not be mutual fear in the home because it is a home and there should be some sort of familiarity and understanding and reasonability between the entity, entities that exist there. I just want all of us to in our hearts today, resolve ourselves that we will be the parents that God wants us to be Amen. and not the parents our kids require because they will tell you, Mom, I want to go on the iPad now. Mom, I don't want to wash the dishes. I want to go play with my friends. They have to understand what is done is to be done before, to get, before you get to do what you have to do. Respect is not fought for, it's earned, and it's also mutual. It goes both ways. If one is respecting and the other is not respecting, is not respect. May God help us, myself included. Even though I have one, it's still challenging. May God help us from this day forward that we will be the parents that, again, Christ wants us to be and hasten his work. So that as we teach our kids, they teach others and hasten the coming of Christ. Thank you. Praise the Lord, man. <laughs> oh.
May the Lord be present between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Amen. <laughs>